Every public body shall give notice of the date, time, and location of its meetings, other than special emergency or continued meetings at least three working days in advance, by posting such notice on its official public government website, if any, placing such notice in a prominent public location at which notices are regularly posted, and placing such notice at the office of the clerk of the public body or in the case of a public body that has no clerk at the office of chief administrator. Reasonable notice under circumstances of special emergency or continued meetings shall be given contemporaneously with the notice provided to the members of the public body conducting the meeting. Ms. Jackson, has today's school board meeting been properly certified? Yes, Dr. Gabriel, on April 2nd, 2019 for item one and May 2nd for items two and three, notice was provided fulfilling all cr criteria of Virginia Code Chapter 37. Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. I duly call this meeting to order. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good Welcome. Afternoon. Uh, today we uh, have the first part of our workshop dedicated to two topics. The first topic being the advisory committee update, and then a second topic, um, an update from um, Dr. Boone on our VRS program. And then we'll go into a closed uh, session and then conduct our business meeting at 7 o'clock. We'll go ahead and begin with the advisory committee update. I'm really appreciative to uh, uh, Mr. Client, Mr. Jordan, for um, reviewing the information and working together. So, um, on this topic. So I'll go ahead and uh, let you two begin and lead us in our discussion of uh, the advisory committees. All right. Uh, well, good afternoon, colleagues. So what's coming around right now is a document that was uh, submitted out uh, uh, today, uh, just as some feedback regarding the um, advisory committees um, and some recommendations. Um, going forward with that. If you all recall the last conversation that we had and, and where we determined um, that a committee of two would be established as an ad hoc between Mr. Jordan and myself to do further review and to come back um, with some recommendations regarding um, advisory committees. Um, I think we're all aware um, they're there, there's policy, um, but one of the things that kind of came out of that was that there's different requirements for each one of them. Um, there's, um, there doesn't seem to be any symmetry um, across the board for each and every one of them regarding um, appointments, regarding how we vote on them, and in, in regards to also um, the timing of those. And so um, it was also determined that a lot of our advisory committees um, are coming up for renewal. We have a lot of members who are coming up for renewal. Um, and, and a portion of that discussion was also to look at how do we actively engage and make it an easier process for individuals in the community to identify opportunities to serve on these advisory committees, considering that these committees directly uh, make recommendations to this board for action. And so um, what I have before you today um, is looking at that and, and um, uh, looking at the system. And one of the recommendations of that um, is really, uh, if you would look at page, I guess the final page of the document kind of gets to the skinny of it. Um, and there's some um, edits and recommendations there, but it talks about the process. And uh, Mr. Jordan and myself uh, did have a conversation in respect of um, uh, this particular portion. Um, and we agree in the respect that um, protocol is a, is a function of the administration. Um, but I don't believe that there's anything wrong in the board making recommendations as to what that particular uh, protocol could potentially look like. And so that's what this looks like um, here on this uh, final page, um, looking at um, the appointment process um, and how those things come in. And so looking at this last portion of the last page, um, a spreadsheet of um, members from each of our four advisory committees um, we maintain with our clerk. Um, and in the past, that had been a function. Um, our clerk maintained um, and worked directly with these committees, um, these advisory committees. Um, and then we wanted to also look at rolling application process, that it's not just something at a, um, a certain part of the year, but that we're also looking at when there's opportunities or when openings happen, um, life happens, and so certain individuals may um, have to come off a committee, um, but that we establish a rolling process. And so we have a application that's online. Um, that individuals are able to, to fill out. Um, but we're also looking at um, kind of putting a little bit more around how that application process works. So um, looking at this application will be submitted to the board clerk. Um, an email um, is sent from the board clerk to the applicant thanking them for their interest and in setting expectations for a follow-up. 
Um, so setting some timelines, and I think we've heard a lot about that in the respect um, of making sure that we're responsive. So when someone submits something, um, that we're able to let them know what the expectation is for response and action. Um, the third item there is um, application is sent to the school board for review. So it's placed on the agenda. Um, so notified by the chair and vice chair in the respect so that it can be placed in the superintendent, placed in the agenda planning. Um, and then the board will vote on it on approved members um, the following monthly business meeting. So happens in January. We're saying that by February we've done the review we're placing it there and we're placing for action so that we can get those individuals involved as soon as possible. Um, the other thing is, is that we realized that there were members across the board. Um, and so identifying skill sets, background, location, geographic, um, and even um, affiliations. Um, so maintaining a spreadsheet that has, um, and in some respect for nonprofits, it would almost be like a board matrix. Um, who are all these individuals? Where are they um, located? And so that as a board or anyone else, we could identify who's representing. Um, you know, for anybody who has any historical context with the city of Norfolk, I know Rodney will probably jump on this one, and um, <laughs> your family had a good, good part of this, of going with the whole ward system when we moved away from. We um, it. <laughs> when we had. Um, you know, we, we had at large, uh, everyone ran. Um, but if you looked at it, there were certain individuals, like our power structure um, for the city was located in one central um, neighborhood, uh, you could almost. So being able to identify that we have true representation across the city is important. Diversity. And diversity. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then the last thing is some type of welcome packet sent to uh, newly appointed members, including an info sheet, um, information regarding FOIA um, and other documents and I've even gone as far as to saying you know we should even do some type of orientation um, for new for these advisory um, committee members and also letting them understand the role the important role that they play um, in the overall um, accountability plan overall uh, strategic plan we want to call it it's direction of the district um, and letting them know that their um, valued feedback is important to us so um, that's that piece there um, there are some edits in here to make it more stream line that literally um, the appointment would be we're bringing it back to the board um, there are some instances where the superintendent makes some appointments some are done by administration um, just so that there is a streamline across the board that it, all those appointment powers will come back to the board so those are really in a skinny a nutshell what that does and to streamline that so mr. Jordan I know we uh, yeah so we uh you guys got a chance to talk about this a couple hours ago. I don't. I think much of what uh, Mr. Clanton described is the current process. I think part of what our challenge has been is just having an opportunity to share with the full board what that process is. Um, I do still have some concerns about the, some of the policy changes. You know, my recommendation was that we take this and send it through the policy committee. Um, and because uh, in the policy committee, they get an opportunity to discuss it, have legal review, get input from uh, from the administration. Because you know we govern through policy, so there's the policy, and then there there are the regulations that describe the how to. And I think that uh, what's described under the application process really belongs in the regulations part of uh, of the policy. The other thing that because we've I think in my almost seven years on the board, we probably have dealt with this five out of the seven years. And so last February 2018, I think, was the last time that we went through this process, changing some of the policies so that we could do the appointments as needed and streamline it. Some of the background, I think, is important for the board to consider, because uh, if we adopt these changes, you know, there's a, you know, we'll eventually vote on it. But uh, just haven't had a chance to look at it um, a couple of hours ago. So when we worked through um, uh, the last revision of changes for this policy, we did go and get feedback from the existing advisory committee. So we met with uh, SHAC, uh, helped and worked them to rebuild. We worked with GIAC, um, CT, and other committees. And part of what uh, you see in here for there, for example, on uh, on the section with uh, GAC under letter C, item one, where it's recommended to strike uh, from recommendations of the full advisory committee 
the reason we had that there and the reason we have that there is uh, we're trying to uh, respect the ongoing work of these committees. So uh, the, the GIAC or other committees, they are out doing this work. They hear from the administrators. They, they do a lot of work. They eventually make recommendations to the board. But part of what they do and others do, they are also constantly out there trying to educate parents and citizens on the work of their committees and recruit families or individuals. So SHAC has a brochure, GIAC has a process, CTE, they all are out there actively trying to encourage individuals to uh, know about the work that they're doing and understand the work. So, when, so if somebody is recommended for appointment, Oftentimes, they may have somebody who may come and observe their meetings for a year or so and kind of learn the work. So then when it comes time for them to make recommendations to the board of superintendent, they feel comfortable that they're recommending folks that can come on board and, and jump in. So we, we put that language in there and kept that language in there for that purpose to encourage and support, uh, at least at that time, the desire of the committees to also be able to make recommendations to the boards with uh, appointments. I mean, ultimately, you know, I don't have any objection to the board making the appointments because that's what we do. But I do think there is value in having uh, the existing committees who are out there constantly hearing from parents. Like at the SEAC, they have an open comment portion. Uh, when we redid the SEAC a couple of years ago, Part of the pool of folks that we pulled from were folks who had appeared before the SEAC or folks that had appeared before the board or people who were just out there that other SEAC members had met through their, through their efforts. So I think in, as part of our work around uh, community engagement that we need to be careful that we don't um, um, diminish the, uh, the ability of, uh, of the committees themselves to, to recruit and recommend. Likewise, with the um, with some of the policies that deal with the nominating or recommendation coming from the superintendent, some of that is likewise intended to uh, give the superintendent an opportunity to nominate individuals and make recommendations based upon the connections, the knowledge, um, the big picture view that the, that the administration has. So if you recall, I think it was at our last work session, we heard from Ms. Goshen and she was describing all the different folks with the CTE committee and how they had subcommittees. So because of that work that they're doing every day, they have uh, an opportunity or should have an opportunity to say to the board, hey, we've gone out, we've recruited folks, they're volunteer, they've engaged. They may be at a subcommittee today, but we would like to see them elevated to be a part of our permanent committee. And so it helps in that advise and consent role to, uh, to have those in there. And, and that's one of the reasons why I just think that I think this is good, but we should probably still send it to the committee, give the, the policy committee, give them a time to look at it and also give the administration time to review it before we do a final adoption. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with what you're saying, um, but, I, and I'm, but I'm not reading this the same way, way as you are because it seems that by just saying that the, um, I think that the nominations for new committee members should come from anywhere, and especially those who are currently sitting on the committee, um, they should be very active in the recruiting process. But, um, you know, and of course, Dr. Boone, I think everyone should be involved, but it's just talking about the process of that goes to the clerk, those recommendations. But I'm not, I don't see where it's discouraging Dr. Boone or any of the committee members. No, no, no. Two separate things. So I'm not speaking to the application process. If you look at the policy, so for example, where I was under Gifted mm -hmm. Education Advisory Committee, or number one, see where it has uh, the membership of the Gifted Education Advisory Committee will be appointed by the school board. And right. the current language says um, from recommendations of the full advisory committee. So, all I'm simply, I was simply explaining why that language was there. So the advantage of having it in the policy, even if the, we decide to reward, reword it, is it codifies in there that we are recognizing and expecting the advisory committee itself to be included in the recommendation process. I agree with you, it doesn't prevent anyone from um, 
making a recommendation because we know right now anyone can volunteer and yeah. make a recommendation. Mm -hmm. But keeping, I, go ahead, sorry. I was just simply saying that if you, you can change the language, but by keeping something in there to that effect, then it says to the uh, committees themselves that part of what our expectation of them is, is to help in the process to vet and recommend candidates, that's all. I would say though that keeping it the way it was makes it look like they only yeah. count. Exactly. Right. That's why I said it needs to be adjusted. I think we could adjust yeah. it so mm -hmm. that we could, because right. I, I agree that mm -hmm. there is value mm -hmm. in hearing directly from the, mm -hmm. the committee itself, mm -hmm. but I think the way it's worded right now, uh, just anyone who's reading it for the first time, it would just mm -hmm. be, I don't have an opportunity because if I don't get a recommendation from the committee. I, I just think mm -hmm. if we reword it to make it a broader, that mm -hmm. like what Mr. Jordan was saying, recommendation, it's a, you know, we're looking for you to do that as a part of your function, mm -hmm. but that anyone else who sees that they might be a good fit, that they could apply. Yeah. Right. Cause if you, I'm sorry, but if you go up to the, uh, I'm sitting here. Yeah, let's, sorry, I'm putting numbers on this. That would have helped. Yeah, what's missing from here is the, existing BCF policy. So the current policy, which speaks to what you all were addressing under, uh, there's a BCF <coughs> umbrella, and it says nominations to the committees, uh, school board members in cooperation with the superintendent will seek recommendations <coughs> for prospective candidates for the committees. Candidates shall represent a broad cross section of the community and meet the requirements for service on the committee and it goes on and it addresses, um, you know, that anybody can be mm -hmm. uh, nominated or recommended. Then under the, what we were just dealing with, with the specific to the gifted education advisory mm -hmm. committee or specific to uh, SEAC and others was spelling out what we were expecting from them. So the, the BCF broadly defines mm -hmm. uh, the effort of trying to have the broad cross-section of the community and that anybody is welcome. But then we had just carried over that piece with Gifted and SEAC and others based upon their, uh, yeah. their current efforts that they had underway. Yeah, but I still think that, um, and I agree with that, I don't disagree about the BCF um, and what it states in uh, subsection C, service on, no, B, uh, nominations for the committee. But I think that there, and, and I guess just a good rule of thumb when we're looking at policy is that it does, the way that it's worded right now, it does present almost a little bit of a conflict and you'd have to go look somewhere else. So if we, whatever we can do to try to make it very plain um, and to show that it's, you know, that anyone could be nominated and we're ex when recommendations could come from the advisor committee, it would just tighten it up. That's mm -hmm. I'm not disagreeing yeah. with the okay. So what if we, what if we put language, since BCF is the broad uh, policy and the uh, individual committees have their uh, policies underneath this one, what if we add, um, we have the language here under B and then you can, we can add uh, some type of a statement that says that um, the board encourages uh, 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 the committees uh, to recruit and recommend individuals for application. Uh, you, you know, we could put something like that, you know, with the superintendent. Uh, but the applications have to come up through to the board. Well, we, we well I think they still do that. Yeah. yeah. I think if, if Ms. Jackson, can you pull the, uh, with the policy, can you scroll down? So within the existing policy, you have those different items, the role of the staff, the committee tenure, uh, the appointment process, the role of board liaisons, uh, scrolling down. And then right here, there are cross-references within the policy under cross-reference to the ones that come beneath it. So if you go to, BCFA, it takes you to, mm -hmm. to one, to uh, CAC, GAC, and so forth. So because there are sometimes different uh, state codes and other things that may exist for those specific committees, that's why you have them out then separate that tries to marry the broad policy mm -hmm. to, the, to the specific one. Can you scroll up just a little bit? And so you can see here, right here under the legal references, that's where it also ties to whatever may be in the state code 
around the requirements around some of the committees that fall within that, within that framework. So the existing policy does provide that overview. Then you go into any individual uh, advisory committee for anything specific there. So the, and the intent there is if you wanted to make a change to the school health advisory committee, you could go in and make that change to that one policy. At one time, it was all merged together. Mm -hmm. So it meant every time you wanted to make one change to one specific thing, you had to make change to everything, and it, be and it became confusion, confusing. Or if the board decided it wanted to add an additional advisory committee, you would just add BCF whatever, add that there, do the cross-reference, and now it has its own, its own framework. Mm -hmm. okay. Ms. Campson? When I read it, I kind of saw it the same way I think that Ms. Patton did. I mean, I'm reading one here, BCFC number two, with the recommendation of the nominating committee and the approval of the superintendent. To me, it looks, every time I read something that's crossed through, it just looks like it's clarifying that the board is the one that's doing the appointments, you know, by, that's why those are crossed off. I, I, it, aside from that, it looks like it's been, like, and appointed by this, and here's another one, the BCFB, and, appo and appointed by the superintendent on behalf of the school board. It just seems like it's, a mat all of those sound like the authority of the board in making the appointments, which is clearly stated at the beginning, is what this is, is clarifying. Um, aside from that, it doesn't seem like we're really making any changes. No one's changing all this stuff, which mm -hmm. looks great. Mm -hmm. It's just a little wording to cleaning clarify, up the language. Yeah, cleaning the, up the language to clarify that yeah. the school board, as it says, makes the appointments and anybody is eligible to apply mm -hmm. without any screen. It looks like it's saying there's no screening between the application and the board. Mm -hmm. No one else gets to pick and choose who gets to come to the board is how I read the corrections that you made and they're just minor little things. All of this just stays in place as it was, which is certainly doesn't look to me like anything needs to be changed there. But everyone I read, when I look at a cross out, basically it's just clarifying that the board makes the decision on who's appointed. So I'm not sure why there's a problem with it. Um, there's, this, this, there's no problem. Oh, the, yeah. the process is we have an existing policy. I was asked to work with Mr. Clanton on some recommendations he shared with me I shared with him some mm -hmm. information he shared some things back we're presenting to the board and what you have in here is not What's in fully what we have here so I just want to make sure that the board is so Miss uh, Jackson can you go to the BCFC click on that one for example So if you notice here, the full policy has the intro language, it has duties and responsibilities, you scroll down, You're not recommending it has other pieces of it. Mm -hmm. So when we are looking at section B, when we look on here, you're not seeing the full policy. Uh -huh. So as I said to Mr. Clan, I don't have any objection to, uh, if it's the will of the board, to have all the, not to, end, to change the policy. So the superintendent doesn't make recommendations that it goes through board. I don't have any problem with it. But I think what's important is that the board has an understanding, which is what we normally do in the policy committee, that you have the existing policy, you have any recommendations for changes, and that you have the opportunity to see the, the changes and have a discussion around why the changes are being recommended. But I do want to, excuse us, Jordan, I cut you off. I, um, I do want to raise the point that we're not taking away. The superintendent would still be like anyone else could make recommendations. The, the language and what we're trying to do here is trying to open it up um, that, uh, and clarify that individuals, you know, parent groups who, who may be the advisor committee, I think will be come out of this discussion, would have the ability to go to that application and fill it out and submit it. If the superintendent found that there was someone that she wanted to, or whoever that, you know, whoever the superintendent is wanted to present that forward, then that's what they could do. Um, I think it's about trying to make sure that we have individuals who are willing um, and that we have a process. And, and, and I think the other thing too is that you, you've stated it, Mr. Jordan, we've, this is here, 
but I think it's also incumbent upon us to make sure that we're following the process and making sure that it happens um, and that we're, we're getting individuals to get there. Now, we've got committees, but we also have a lot of openings, um, and I think there's an opportunity for us to kind of clean that up. But we're not trying to change the whole policy. We're just talking about mm -hmm. clarifying a small okay. portion of this. Mm -hmm. and, and how long would we need to wait as we sit here with all these advisory committees with openings on them? It seems like things tend to take a long time mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. done mm -hmm. uh, by this board. Um, would we have a hard deadline that would say they would report back next month and we would vote on it? Or would it drag on for the next six months? He already presented that mm. timeline. I thought mm. that was yeah, really I think good. we're looking no, at, we it's almost like 60 days. So we get it in one month and the next month okay. we're taking action. Long, and it's a hard deadline because we don't always seem to honor our deadlines well, It's either. just like in anything. You want to get people on board it quickly and get them um, hitting the ground running. Okay. And you lose interest. Ms. Bassine? Um So currently we have two committees that currently the policy states that the superintendent will be making the appointments, which is SHAC and the CTE. Yes. So if, as Mr. Jordan said, if the recommendation is to provide this to go through, uh, to provide these uh, documents to go through the uh, policy committee, is this board recommending that we change the policies that is the change that i see that are, are you recommending that we change the policies to be that all committee appointments be done by the board well, yes well, yeah and, <clears throat> and honestly because we're having the conversation here mm -hmm. i don't even think we need to go back to the policy committee i just think that we need to wordsmith it on the things that we've heard from here and bring it back um, I'm a strong believer that you send back to committee work, but the simple fact that we created an ad hoc committee to review this, this is a recommendation coming from the ad hoc committee back to the board. Um, not dismissing anything that you do there, but I, again, uh, not for the sake of sending things and holding it up, but that would be another month before we even got to it. And we're looking at June right in the face where several of these members are up for um, renewal. And I think that it's only fair for us to be able to, um, to put a process in place, clean some things up, and then be able to make appointments and also to let other individuals know there's opportunities to be able to serve. Um, and so that's no slight to you and your committee well, whatsoever, I'm but I'm just saying I think that we could yeah. cut the whole process out because we're already here having a conversation. We've had two. Okay. But we still need to come back to the discussion. Are we agreeing that, um, that the board will be making all the appointments with in collaboration with the superintendent yeah, yes I, that. Okay. Yeah. I mean the superintendents but just like right now this would be the, the government this thing. is what I'm expecting yeah. this environment that she could weigh in have yeah yeah I mean that's how we've been doing so, even though it's been you know she's brought recommendations obviously forward. the voting would be the board members right so yeah so to that point dr. Gabriel number three in that section B you have to uh, strike that and saying the CTE oh, yeah. Yeah. advisor, you would have to strike number three. That one is, does not have any markings on it because that wouldn't be consistent with what's happening in two. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So number three, the CTE, Korea Tech Ed advisor, B3. Okay. Yeah. That would have mm -hmm. to be taken out mm -hmm. also. But yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, my, my opinion on the CTE one is that we um, keep the process by which there's a nominating committee of the CTE advisory committee itself. I think there's um, value and also um, a certain level of efficiency having the uh, that advisory committee and perhaps others, but at this time, that advisory committee making some recommendations because of their knowledge and experience with the work and uh, industry and so forth. I think that as a board, we always have the right to uh, final approval. Um, but I think it's going to, we run the risk of putting even additional burden and responsibility on the board to try to do all this vetting and uh, well, I think we have a committee and they do good work and have been doing good work and I think it's good to try to empower and provide support for uh, for our volunteers who are doing this work with uh, with our staff 
So let me just restate to make sure I'm understanding exactly what you're saying. Specifically for the CTE policy, you want to have language in there that says, um, based on what we know about how the CTE committee has functioned um, currently and in the past, for their applicants, if they have interest to come through a nominating committee, the nominating committee um, alerts the boards uh, in some fashion, uh, whether that be through an email or, um, you know, letting us know. And then we still get the applications through the clerk, but we know that the nominating committee has endorsed them. Yeah, basically I'm just recommending that we leave the policy as is. Um, and if the board wants to take out uh, the approval of the superintendent, you know, the board can do that. But I'm saying right now we have an existing policy that includes a nominating committee from that advisory committee and I'm just saying that my feeling is we should okay. leave it in there uh, or if we decide to remove it we should at least give the uh, that committee the courtesy to know that the board is considering it mm -hmm. and get their feedback because we don't know right now you know they could be in the process of doing that and I just don't want to pull the rug out from under folks or mm -mm. anything like that mm -mm. okay okay yeah I also think that even with the others like with uh, GAC and SEAC, we should give them, if the board is considering these changes, we should give them notice and alert that we are doing that because I just remember the amount of time that they spent putting all this stuff together and I don't want to just have them blindsided if we make, make these changes. Right. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. All right. Okay. So we so we'd have to get redline versions of the full policies mm -hmm. and re adopt them next month. Mm -hmm. Right? Is yes. that the timeline you're yes, okay. next month. Okay. The other thing I just so want to be clear, need, clear about under the existing policy, there is nothing that has prevented the board from making appointments. We can make appointments today right. if we have gone through a process and folks have submitted it and that's why we were working with the clerk to get the application redone because what occurred was with the changes from uh, in clerks the online application was going to an email address that the current clerk and administration didn't have access to so they redid the form so that they could get access to the um, to the application but part of what we need to do is to make sure that we are constantly advertising so that we are getting that broad cross section of the of the community, and we know some people, uh, you know, are online, some people aren't. So, to me, as part of some of the efforts that the board has talked about in regards to community engagement, it's an opportunity for us, um, kind of like what we had on the calendar before. We could spend the mm -hmm. summer mm -hmm. really promoting uh, the advisory committees, what they are, community engagement, how many openings that we have. And what we had, what our intent was this year was in September to then adopt those recommendations. So I think if you really, I think it's a good thing for the board to do this. It's really an opportunity to promote the work that we're doing, spend some time, get the word out there, get the applications in the libraries, and like yeah. we would do with anything else, have the applications come in, and yeah. then as part of our July work, we can review yeah. them, and mm -hmm. then by August, September, be ready to make the appointments and you read doctor. my mind yeah I just have always done <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. but yeah and I mean and I wholeheartedly agree with uh, mr. Jordan in this respect I think even going a step further mm -hmm. um, and you know when we go to our website and we have um, you know about our division and we've got school board um, it would be really nice to even just have a page that's dedicated to Great. our boards mm -hmm. and advisory team yep. mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. you not only have a We've central place to that. get the application, mm -hmm. you've got the information, but more importantly, the work that's happening in those committees and those advisory groups could be listed there. 
um, the more things that we can give to the community um, and to let them know, because you may have yeah. somebody who, who has an interest yeah. in it. So. I and, agree. Yeah. And piggybacking on um, what we had kind of discussed um, the last time that we had the discussion about the advisory committee, I really like the idea of doing, with um, Channel 47, doing um, okay. a little piece, a video. We can get that out and push that out. And then um, looking at a time, uh, maybe twice during the school year, during the calendar year, where they can come and um, perhaps present to us or or how we can get just some mm -hmm. small little snippets not minutes um, but just some small little mm -hmm. snippets as to what's going on in each of the committees oh, so MPS now I'm not quite sure we've got it built in there but there's there's plenty of opportunities mm -hmm. that we can utilize to get the information out. okay yeah but just mm -hmm. no, I'm sorry go ahead I'll just speak to, so in the when we worked on this before and we were talking about getting these you know updated so under the overarching policy under f where we have board liaisons mm -hmm. that was the idea there that uh, um, you know the board members don't vote they're not counted as the quorum but at our work sessions where we have uh, board reports mm -hmm. that would be the opportunity yep. for board members who are these liaisons to mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. just want to mm -hmm. give you a heads up these are some things that are happening with the different committees but also being respectful of the the committee work so that we don't right. start we making don't recommendations before the yeah. committees have finished mm -hmm. their work and I think that's one of the things that um, Dr. Gabriel has um, taken really from a recommendation that you had Mr. Jordan in regard to moving forward with the agendas uh, making sure that there's time for us to actually report out um, from the different advisory groups and as liaisons that we're able to give the full picture of what's going on uh, to mm -hmm. the board Okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Boone, and then I just um, want to go to the page on appointment process okay. and want to be able to build a strong bridge between rolling applications and the board receiving those applications because we don't want them to get lost in that, mm -hmm. you know, something comes in, the clerk sends it to the board, but we don't necessarily have a timeline for when those will be addressed. And I think that's something that, and I don't have a recommendation since, you know, seeing this now, I don't have a recommendation. But I think, again, there should probably be an appointed time in this process that the clerk would forward to it. You know, is it monthly, is it whatever else, so that we don't lose applications mm -hmm. in, in the, um, the, the host of uh, emails we get daily. Mm -hmm. So just something to think about in terms of that process, because when you say rolling applications, we just need to figure. And then it says application is sent to the school board. Well, sometimes you could be getting them daily, and they would get lost mm -hmm. in the shuffle. So if we can try to define the process of when those will be sent to yeah, the board mm -hmm. a certain time each month or something. Yeah. And, and I agree with you, Dr. Boone. I just think that um, a rolling process is almost creates a, a bank of our nominees mm -hmm. um, so that we can always go to right. we may not have an opening now mm -hmm. but we may have one a couple months later mm -hmm. I, I agree but I just my, my concern is from the application mm -hmm. to the board's hands mm -hmm. making sure that again we aren't sending them sometimes daily or something depending on when they come in and they get lost in in, in the bank of emails that you can receive create a folder so, or something well you could yeah we could but I, I just mm -hmm. I'm just saying yeah so I don't have a that yeah. just didn't want them to get That's lost good, in that uh -huh. and That's honestly good. when we get down to that that depth Deep. of detail um, that would honestly I would send that back to the administration for you all to figure out what works best mm -hmm. and then it comes back to us mm -hmm. with the well, I just addressed it because you have an application process mm -hmm. listed here so that's why I brought it up. Okay. All right. Ms. Bassine? Um, the one one thing that I, I would like to see us address is also a feedback mechanism. So when our advisory committees yeah. provide us with their end of year reports, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I know, at least for a couple of them, that's been a source of frustration is that, um, you know, they provide us with a report right. with recommendations. Mm -hmm. The board, you know, receives it, but other than a thank you, you know, some don't get anything back. Like, you know, what are we going to do with that recommendation? And uh, Mr. Jordan mentioned at the last meeting, I believe we had an opportunity uh, previously to do the chat and chew where we had, you know, was able to have we were able to have a discussion around some of those recommendations, but we've kind of gotten away from that. Um, so I want to see us bring that back, um, yeah. you know, into into the work because they need to feel like 
um, that the time that they spend, and they spend a lot of time um, doing the work, doing the analysis, uh, making sure that we're following, you know, the, the plans that are in place. Um, so they need to feel like their time is being well spent. Mm -hmm. and, and I hear you on that, and that is definitely something that um, I've thought about as I've tried to frame this conversation. I think starting first with the application process, getting that under control, and then that's the next topic to tackle. How are we as a board, how do we want to receive that information? Is it right. presenting to the board? Is it getting the updates and the, how we give them the information back? Well, I, I bring it up now as part of this because if we're starting to address some of the, the language change in the policies, mm -hmm. that is Another one thing that needs mm -hmm. to be included. Yeah. So okay. it is, you know, not necessary. If you're looking to adopt a policy next month, then that needs to yeah. rise okay. Okay. in priority. Yeah. It, okay. So. Well, I was going to say, and yes. part of that, it may be of value just again for the board to hear um, from the administration um, again how that the process works with the different local plans that may be tied to some of these committees so in in one sense there's the letters we may receive from GAC we got a letter from uh, SEAC I think back in January or February and they may speak to some broad issues for the board to consider but then as part of the work of the committees, at least in some of the committees, when we review the CTE plan, when we review the uh, gifted plan, the special education plan, there is an internal process that's going on where those advisory committees are providing feedback or receiving information as part of that plan development process. So then when the board is voting on the plan once we receive it with, from the recommendation from the administration, we are in essence, responding to that feedback process, we're just not necessarily always in that sausage making, which is a little different from the letters that we receive that may be broader than what's specific to that local plan. I just think it's important we understand that so we don't get, get the too confused. So um, let me, let me uh, wrap this up by saying that um, we sincerely appreciate the uh, efforts and the uh, service that all of the members of these committees are providing. And um, we know that they are working very hard right now. And um, this process that the board has undertaken is a uh, means to get us acquainted with what the process is and to better streamline um, accessibility, uh, but, um, the best representation that we can get, and to um, put forth uh, steps uh, so that the process is, is easy for them. So next steps uh, is going to be um, red line versions and clean versions of these uh, policies uh, sent out to the board for feedback. Uh, Ms. Jackson, um, <coughs> if you can work on uh, compiling that database of the members of all the committees with their names, their contact info, and what else do we have here? Terms. Terms. Um, we need to have some language considering a feedback mechanism. I could, I could mm -hmm. put that in there. Um, we said addresses, right, or zip code at least. So we can figure out where they're coming from. I think info can be their address, and you said something about um, affiliations yeah. affiliations um, a feedback mechanism and then when we come back to this um, discussion um, we can uh, outline some steps for advertisement and making sure that um, we're doing our job with uh, getting the information out to prospective um, members so, um Dr. Moon, is it okay if we, I know I brought up the idea about a website or at least a web page. I'll take you back to the senior team, okay. these mm -hmm. comments, and we'll work on that. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. And just for clarity, so I, the, we got a, um, I think um, Ms. Jackson had responded to a request that you had sent earlier, and we received these various rosters. Are we saying, 
are those correct or we're saying we're going to go back and look at them again um I, I can't i can't work with the information that we have there it's in so many different places i think it's easier if we have one sheet with all of the members um and their information and base it off of that now that information that was provided to us it um like the GAC shows um, members who have how many members have been at meetings members who haven't been at meetings um, so that is imp is important but I think we need to just start with a baseline of who do we have in each committee their information when they were appointed and what is their term limit oh I'm not I just want to be clear so we're doing you wanted to do a different spreadsheet is that what you're asking for there is no spreadsheet well, all we have right now are different forms of how things are organized in each of the different committees we were asked to get the information the yeah. membership of each committee yeah. and that's what that's, that's, what, that's what it is compile right there. It. so the shac one looks different from the GAC one looks different from the cte one we just need it simplified that's all i'm asking for all right so we have next steps um we are going to be prepared to vote on the recommendations at our formal meeting in june okay, okay. I appreciate the work that you guys have done on this. And I just want to make sure, because I didn't hear it, that we also uh, look at the uh, report out um, that you mentioned as well. Feedback. Feedback. Feedback mechanism. Okay. Mm -hmm. It could be that they would receive some sort of timely feedback, and that may vary depending on, you know, the committee. But so if you generalize, you know, keep it general, but yeah. make it... Uh, so would it be just to clarify would it be included with the june 5th policy discussion just to make sure that everything is yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. all right so yep mm -hmm. so miss jackson if you could under the um policy discussion for the june 5th work session if you could put advisory committee policies Dr. Boone, VRS program. Yes, this is a um, kind of different request of the board. Um, something that has, has come down to the district from VRS with the goal of making an opportunity available to our employees. So I'm going to ask Ms. Ingram if she, or I can walk us through whichever way. It, it, it's a new benefit opportunity for employees um, to have long-term care insurance. We currently have accessibility to long-term care through our benefits package in Norfolk Public Schools. Um, folks can opt in. This is another long-term opportunity directly through VRS. Nothing that NPS has to do in terms of payroll deduction. We don't manage the program. A, a board approval would allow our employees to be able to access this opportunity um through vrs it is portable so if folks go to other school districts or wherever else they, they can maintain it payments will go directly to the third party entity that manages this so this is why we bring this to the board did i miss anything Ms. you got it okay. so dr boom we're set to take um action on this item um, in today's tonight's meeting yes yes I mean mm -hmm. uh, again it, it just opens up another benefit it, it mm -hmm. unlike those that go through our open enrollment there is an enrollment process and timeline associated with this with the state but it, it gives uh, I think a choice to our employees to decide which long-term care um, program they may be interested in there's one through mm -hmm the uh, Norfolk Consortium benefits package and then this becomes another external to that so this wouldn't show up in the consortium documents and so um, employees would be notified of this availability okay. are there any questions from the board she answered mine about the portability so is this a one-time agreement or will it come before us annually 
think it, in the, it comes up for a renewal, I think, in the agreement. They, they only open it up certain times. This is a Commonwealth of Virginia program, and they have done some modification to their program, so they are opening up to those who have not participated, to school divisions and political subdivisions. So this is a one-time opportunity now to offer it to our employees. Actually, the the excuse me, I'm sorry. The term of this agreement is for three years, beginning at the date of its execution. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. So right now this item is set to um, be under the consent agenda. Is everyone okay with it being under the consent agenda? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Boone. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Ingram. All right. Um, well, that concludes our um, discussion for the workshop. Um, um, well, I guess we can do it in close. Then. Okay. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to enter into closed session? I make a motion to enter into closed session. Second. Second. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, Ms. Martin made the motion, and the second was Ms. Smith. Mm -hmm. Move that members of the school board go into closed session for the purposes which are set out subsection A of section 2.2-3711 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act as amended for A, discussion or consideration of the performance of uh, specific officers and employees of the Norfolk Public Schools pursuant to subsection 1 of the above cited code section. The subjects of this section of the motion are regular, are the regular personnel docket of this date and the discussion of the resignation and possible replacement of a specific employee. B, the discussion or consideration of disciplinary or any other matters concerning students in Norfolk Public Schools that would involve the disclosure of information contained in the scholastic record pursuant to subsection 2 of the above cited code section. The subject of this portion of the session is a regular student support docket of this date. C, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members, consultants, or attorneys pertaining to actual or probable litigation or other specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by counsel pursuant to subsection 7 and 8 of the above cited code section. The subject of this section of the motion refers to advice of counsel as needed regarding legal issues related to the personnel and student matters identified above and the taking of minutes in the executive session. And for the vote, Ms. Bassine? Aye. Ms. Hampson? Aye. Mr. Clanton? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Ms. Martin? Aye. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Dr. Gable? Aye. Ms. Jackson? Aye.